Thank you for coming. My voice is very raspy tonight because my wife gave me something. Okay. <laughs> I have a lot of material to go through. <clears throat> Best I've been able to do it when I practice it was one hour. So we'll see what we can do. I'll answer any questions you've got afterwards, or my phone number is in the local book, so you can get a hold of me. Uh, this is the third in a series of presentations that I've given on the ho old homesteads here in Boone County. Uh, this also ended my ninth year doing it, so I'm starting my tenth year now in March. This one is on Absalom Grays. Uh, but before we do that, I do have to thank a few people. Dennis Helmer, who owns the property, who has allowed me to be on it whenever I wanted to do what was needed. Curtis Stamper, who is his uh, manager of the farm for him, who has helped me find the first two sites. Steve Cochran, who lives clear down in Tampa, Florida, who has helped with the uh, determining GPS positions, helping me identify old points. Very great man, and he has the ability to look up any information you're trying to find. Also, Roger Banks, uh, who's with the University of Kentucky, who has helped me with uh, maps, GPS, overlaying and scaling uh, maps. Hillary Delaney, I know you know who that is, here in the library. She's been very good in helping me uh, find old information that I could not locate. And then a very, ner very nice person you haven't heard of, her name is Dario Bledsoe. This poor soul had to help me put the books together. So that's where we're at on that. Uh, Absent Graves is what we're going to discuss tonight. As you can see, he has a very, uh, Dennis Helmer is the owner, he has a very beautiful farm. There's a lot of very beautiful rolling hills with hail bale, hay bales on them too, which is quite impressive. But what was going on here? Uh, there was a fort here, Fort Washington, over in Cincinnati area between 1789 and 1803. It was built by a Joseph Harmer. In 1803, these soldiers were taken uh, away from that fort and placed in Newport. That's uh, so a little bit about the people, the Absalom Graves. John Graves was born in 1737, he died in 1825. He had a family of 12 children, he was in the Revolutionary War. He came from Culpeper, Virginia, by flatboat in 1797. So the fort there was to protect the settlers and to push the Indians out of this northwest area. So it was a rather dangerous trip coming down here. One of his children was Absalom Graves. He was born in 1768, died in 1826. That's a year after his father died. He had a lot of illness throughout his whole life, uh, liver problems especially. So he came on the flatboat in 1797. In 1799, his father helped him become the first official clerk of court for Boone County. 1801, he married his wife, Felicia. 1802, he bought his first piece of land, and he bought that off of Watts. 1803, he joined the North Bend organization, which was a group of churches trying to survive. Uh, there was some bickering between them, uh, but he was a very calm-mannered person and led the charge to help the churches work together and grow. A very, very important gentleman. Uh, Absalom's children were Willis, Nancy, Polly, and Elizabeth. Uh, his son Willis uh, was a practicing attorney here in Boone County and also was involved in banking. Uh, Absalom Graves, there's a few comments about him that I found. His continued care for the churches and all their concerns was a distinguishing feature in his character. The mildness of his disposition, the evenness of his temper, and the regularity of his manners were such as to give him a decided 
influence over his brothers and sisters and associates, even though they were older than him. So they generally re referred to him to handle their disputes and arbit arbitration. He was distinguished and beloved not only in the bounds of the association, but many other churches in Kentucky, Ohio, and Indiana. This was a very important gentleman. Um, I've got a bunch of copies here. They're about seven pages each. For anybody that would like to know more about him, there's a ton of information there. You can pass them down. Yes. Uh, this is from the courthouse. It's a uh, slide of uh, him becoming clerk of court. He was clerk of court for most of the time between 1799 and his death in 1826. There was a year in there that he was not. Uh, his father, John, helped him become clerk of court. Uh, they had to post a 1,000 pound uh, bond that uh, they would make sure that the uh, resources in the uh, courthouse were kept safe. Next is his will. Uh, he says, being weak and infirm of body, but sound of mind. This was a little bit different from what I've seen before. It really didn't say this person's going to get this land or anything. In fact, it said that the family, the four children and the wife would get together and figure out what she would need to live and make sure she was taken care of. Also, uh, there's a note there on the second page. Down near the bottom, uh, where he's making sure that the grandchildren are taken care of too. You run into a very interesting comment though. Absalom Graves is to become a executor. Well, you think not since he's passed on. But there was another Absalom Graves Jr. And at that time, uh, if they thought a person they really liked, they would name that child after him. So if you go and try and check the, the different land transfers, you've got a problem. <laughs> Uh, this is called an appraisement of a state. You learn a lot by looking at these. On the first page there at the bottom, it talks about his cattle. It not only talks about them, it tells what color they were <laughs> and how much each one of them was worth. He had 17 cattle. Next. The next page, it even gets more interesting. You find out he had three oxen, eight horses, 50 hogs, and 97 sheep. So here's a man that's a minister in a church. He's clerk of court. He's got this gigantic farm. And he's got 175 animals on it he's got to take care of, as well as crops. Um, he had seven slaves. If you look at the document closer, you find out how much they actually paid for tobacco then. It says he had a crop of uh, 13,000 pounds was worth $227. That's a penny point seven five a pound. Wow. Uh, you look further and they even have a price for the sugar that's on his table. $6.50. Uh, they talk about even his volumes uh, different information, the number of Bibles he had, how much each Bible was worth. So you can learn about a lot about the person and what he was trying to accomplish. Uh, this just shows the final page. There's not a lot on that, but I want you to see it. it he had some wool, so they put a price of seven dollars on it. So how do you get started in this? Well, you've got to find an 1883 map that you can get from uh, the library. If you're smart, you'll go and talk to the hunters and farmers that own the area because they know what's there. They walk on it all the time. You'll need to work with some map specialists, GPS specialists, and you're going to do a lot of walking. Uh, behind you, against the wall there, you'll see two uh, maps. The one on the left is black and white, uh, which is basically how you start uh, finding the different sites. Uh, you put little tags where they're at on that map. 
have one on the right is after two or three years of work, you find you didn't have four sites on that place, you had 20. Next, Next is an aerial view of the uh, uh, Helmer property and the Pyatt property. The Pyatt property is up there on the left, all of this here, and this, this is owned by parents. He has a mile of a riverfront there. There's only about 40 miles of riverfront on the Ohio River that I know of. Over here, this is where all the absolute graves was. Uh, eventually, about 1977, I think it was, the state bought this one and put in uh, 275. You can see the ponds there and everything. Next, Next is just another view to show you uh, uh, who owns all the properties that area. These are the people you would have to contact. Next. So here's what you look like when you do it. <laughs> you're, sweated, you're sweated out. You've been beat, bitten by mosquitoes. You think you can't get a wa enough water to drink. Your old clothes even look old now. You got ticks climbing all over and you got poison ivy. But I tell you, it will keep you healthier. You will, you will probably live a little bit longer and you'll get a sense of uh, happiness that you were able to accomplish something. I would encourage everybody to try and do something like that. If you can't spend that much time, I would suggest you help us with a problem we've got where all the old barns are deteriorating and falling down. It would sure be nice to have a picture of them, you know who owned it, and put it in a book so that we know what Boone County had. If any of you decide to do in this work, I will be more than happy to work with you. Okay? Next. So how do you find these places? Well, we have one here. Curtis showed me that and showed me this one here. And what you can do is get a uh, GPS reading on the two, then measure the distance between the two, and then do an overlay with a modern map to scale and you can find out where that place is, and if you've done your math right and everything, you'll be within 100 feet of where that is. On the Robert uh, Pye property at East Bend, uh, we didn't have good answers. It took three years to find a graveyard. Hmm. Next. The next slide is basically just showing what I was telling you about how to find these sites. Let's go on to the next. So in the end, there were about four little squares there on that map when we started. Now there's 20. Uh, I've moved it on the topography map so that people can get a better understanding of where these properties are. All this information by year is in your library. Hardbound books. Over in this area here, Dave Cohegan and I walked from over and here, over, and you get into this section of that property, and it's all you can do to walk. There's gullies 30, 40 feet deep. The big trees laying on. Nice. So in the end, you end up with all of your sites, the GPSs, so that somebody coming after you can have a chance to find them. Okay. Can you read a couple of those for us that we kind yeah. of I give the descriptions? Uh, well, let's go over one that there was a snafu with. If I can find it. Hold on. Okay, we'll go over this one. Uh, here's one I marked DH7. I have not been able to find it yet. I know that's what we figured out their coordinates are, but I can't find it. If you come down here, here's another one, DH18. There's supposedly a log cabin on that property, about 100 feet uh, from a neighbor's property. Can't find it. Uh, one person said uh, to me two years ago, uh, he could show me where it's at, but I haven't got him out in the woods yet, so I haven't been able to. But uh, others will say, like, uh, Absalom Gray's house and well, 39.05.35.3, that's in uh, NAD 83 degrees, minutes, and seconds. Okay? So that's the purpose of getting it all together. Thanks. The next just shows the land transfers. Uh, 
this took me well over 50 hours at the courthouse. But this is just the first page. You can see up at the top there, um, Thurston uh, got a patent for 2,000 acres near the mouth of Miami. He uh, then sold 1,000 acres of it to uh, Pyatt and Watts. Uh, Pyatt and Watts split up, and uh, Watts then sold this uh, on over to Absalon Graves, 279 acres for 300 pounds. But that's in the book too, and uh, it shows everything up to present day. So let's look at the first site next. This is site one and two. Uh, I call them DHs for Dennis Helmer, so we know what the property is. Up at the top right there, you have a little well. Uh, it's about uh, nine feet across, but about 12 feet deep. Uh, down below that there, uh, you will find uh, a spring house. And then this part here, so this is a spring house here. Down here, I didn't even see that for two years. The stones had gone down into the ground. I was coming back to, to re, uh, cut everything down so that I could see what was going on because I had found some uh, farm equipment pieces here. So it ends up that there's another room on there. But then up here, I found that there's actually steps going down into this structure. And then over here, there's actually a pathway going into this. There may have been a second structure on top of that uh, spring house. Um, how can I say it's a spring house? It's got down the ground five, six feet. I, I'm not an expert. I can't tell for sure, but that's my interpretation. Uh, found uh, a lot of high debris there, uh, horseshoes, etc., which we'll look at. Uh, well, here's what you find when you go. <laughs> You better have a good weed eater and a lot of mosquito repellent. So you have to get rid of it. That's, here's the wonderful well. You just love to fall on that. <laughs> Curtis Stamper's uh, father was driving a truck in this field and the truck went in head first. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> so these are the things you have to be careful of. You just can't go walking through fields having a nice daydream or something. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a picture of the inside of the well. It was dry. I have not been down in it. I don't think I will go. I may lower a metal detector down there, but I don't think I'll go down in it. So here's what you're fighting. You're in a field. you got to go out and cut it all down. And you've got to get it nice and short so you can see if you can find uh, any pottery or any metal, et cetera, there, and use your metal detector. I about wore that weed eater out. <laughs> Next. And there's what the foundation looked like that I told you I found at the end of the second year. There's a rock, and you can just barely see them there. They had really sunk into the ground. Next. So then we start finding horseshoes. That's more horseshoes than I ever in that one little place than I found in a total property ever. Some strange is going on. Next. Again, another horseshoe, an axe, and a miscellaneous metal. Next. More horseshoes. And miscellaneous metal. Next. Oh, here we find something nice. I worked with Tom Schiffer on this. This is an old uh, rifle gun, a buttstock of it, a brass plate. Uh, he, in his knowledge, and he knows more than any of us, he thinks that's probably about 1750. So this was probably an old gun before it got here. Boom came here, what, about 1775, somewhere in there? Yeah. So that's sort of an amazing find. Uh, if you find anything at all with guns, that's very rare. Next. More farm equipment. Next. Uh, this is called a trifecta of horseshoes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't find three horseshoes in one day. It was an unlucky day. 
My wife will let you know. Horse might be there. <laughs> so here's a summary of everything that was found there. Eleven horseshoes, two axes, gun uh, butt plates. There's something more than farming going on here. We've got to try and find out what it is. So let's go up to the next site, which is DH3, which is maybe 80 yards away. There's a big power line going through. It was about 50 feet from that wooded area there. And that wooded area, it's about five feet until you hit this little stone well. Very high debris area, higher than anything I've seen. So this is what you see. I wasn't trying to jump in, okay? I was just trying to get a, a picture of the well. Down below it there, you can see all the moss and everything. It's really a beautiful sight. It really is. That well is only about five foot deep, maybe four foot. I may decide to go in with that unless I can get my wife to do it. <laughs> the area was really miserable. Uh, it is so thick with brush and small trees and things. Next. So I called in the squad. <laughs> I have my grandson Eli there, Emmy, my granddaughter, and they were very helpful. And that's my wife. <laughs> I had to put uh, poles around that well because they could get hurt there. Next. So then we really fight, start finding weird things. That particular coin up top uh, is an 1864 coin, metal, copper coin that says Abraham Lincoln for president. It evidently had a slight silver finish to it. And then on the right is the reverse side. That coin drove me nuts. Uh, there must have been seven, eight layers of roots on top of it. It was a foot down. And after about the seventh visit, I just said, I'm not going to do anything else today. I'm just going to find whatever that is. Down below it, so that was fine at that, found at that site. Down below it, you have a button that says best. And you see an eagle and some stars. This is a button made in the United States. At that time, um, England was producing most of the buttons, and we were sort of having, having a button war. That best shows that it was silver plated at one time. Next. To me, this is the rarest thing I've ever found. As you can see, it's only about a centimeter up the width, and it goes about a centimeter and a half out. And you can see some markings on it. Well, it was a Charles IV. Uh, pillar dollar that was minted between 1768 and 1808. How do you find that out? Well, you find the con you call the connoisseur of coin. That's Steve Cochran down in Tampa, Florida. He's connected with a coin company, and he started overlaying them with his company records until he found out what coin it was. Now, here's the interesting part. 1800, how in the world did it ever get all the way up here in this tiny little field? It had to go through trading posts or businesses, whatever. These are little pieces of silver, excuse me, were cut out quite a bit from the original coins, and they were used as tender until about 1857. After that, they wouldn't accept them. That's an extremely unusual piece. Next. But we're not done yet. Here's a pewter button, 28 millimeters in width, probably was a jacket button. Down below it you have a lockbox key, a buckle, and a uh, copper decorative piece uh, about the size of your thumbnail that could have been on a saddlebag or something, I don't know. So all that was found there, but there's more. Keep going. Next. Horseshoes, down below, parts of a cast iron stove. Next. Then another unusual item. I'm not sure what it is, but it looks like a plate. 
You've got the top rim around it on top, and down below you've got another rim going around it, and it's about eight inches. I don't know if it's a piece of farm equipment. To me, it looks like a plate. I don't know. I'll leave that for somebody else to figure out. Nice. And we really aren't done. In this, remember, this is only about 50 square feet that all this was found in. There's three axes. One of them looked like it was blacksmith made, and of course, there's more horseshoes. Uh, you see up top there an old iron. Uh, down below, some more uh, parts to a stove. And one of them said French on it, but I couldn't read the rest of it. Uh, and then we found a colonial style uh, barn hinge. And then a smaller one down below, uh, a leg from a cast iron stove. There's no uh, coal there at all. They must have just burned wood, period. There's other sites on this place that burned a lot of coal. Thanks. So a summation of the coins in that. Uh, there was one up top there I haven't showed you the picture of yet that I'll show you. The two best uh, marked coins, the Abraham Lincoln, uh, the little sliver of a uh, Spanish reel, and then the button. And I'm not an expert on buttons either. Uh, but that looks like a military button to me. Uh, people that are in the know on this kind of thing can probably tell you more about it. And then we find just a, it's just a little thing, it's about that long. It looks like it was probably a bathtub with a little kid sitting in it or something, some type of toy. So that shows you that, gee, there was a lot of things going on at different periods of time here. That's, then let's top it off. How about a Civil War spur? <laughs> <laughs> it's brass. Next. So this will list basically of the key items that were found there. And you've got to say to yourself, with the Civil War coin, um, with uh, buttons and spurs, it was close this site now is close to Federal Hall. Federal Hall got its name for having Union soldiers there during the Civil War. And we have to remember, uh, they thought that uh, the Confederates might break through and get on top of the bluffs, et cetera, facing Cincinnati and do some dirty work. So they had what they called 5,000 squirrel hunters ready to stop them. So if you put all this together, they must have been there. There's too much military for them not to have been. But here again, that's my assessment. We can leave it up to people in the future that want to think about it more. Next. This is the graveyard. 31 people buried there, and seven of them were children. Next. That's what the graveyard looked like. It had weeds five foot tall. The whole pasture was like this. So I had put an orange thing on something, a tag on something, so I'd know where in the world it was at. Next. So Dave Cohegan and my wife helped me clean up the area, but we did not move one single stone. They're exactly as they were. I want you to look at that thorn tree way back there. Next. And remember that. Here's my wife. She didn't want to get sunburned. If it was bad enough, she's going to get bush burned. <laughs> uh, she's basically uh, writing down the information on every single tombstone. Every tombstone had a picture taken of it, and it's in the book uh, from 17. Thanks. Here's Absalom Graves' uh, tombstone. I've tried to read it from the picture, and I can't. I've got to go back with some real thin paper, uh, run the lead over it. Uh, pencil type thing and try and get a reading as to what it really says. He was so impressive, I'll bet it says some nice things. So that thorn tree sticking out there, nobody liked to go near it, and I see something iron there. So I walk up, it's the cemetery gate. Two cherubs on top. So I called the uh, landowner, Mr. Helmer, got a hold of uh, Curtis, and I said, what do you want to do with this? And they said, nothing. We don't care if we even have it. And I said, 
well, tomorrow they got to work on my back, so I guess I better try and take it home today. <laughs> First I caught heck because I shouldn't have done that because of my back. Second, she has enough rust around the house as it is. <laughs> so I took it to uh, one place when I was better, and they refused to work on it. They said they would destroy it. So from there, um, I used my drill and a wire wheel, cleaned off all the rust I could, and there's a chemical that you can put on which will neutralize the iron so that it can't rust. So I've done that, and it looks pretty good. The next is site 12. This is a shame, but this is the site. Uh, here you have the house. The road goes here. The house did not face the road. <laughs> the house faced this way. You see all that BT? That means brick and tin. In 1977, the current owner took a look at that building and said, this is bad shape. Somebody's going to get hurt. So he came in with his friendly bulldozer and bulldozed it down. And it went right into the basement. So as trying to find out what was going on with this place, I, I dug at least 80 holes and all I got was 10. I had to give up. I had to choose an area around the side that maybe didn't have as much brick and tin so I would have a chance. Uh, I looked over in this area and I started finding horseshoes and a hinge. Over here I found some pieces of farm equipment. Back here I found was a dump area and even had a boar's tusk in it. And then I found this weird structure here and it ended up to be the front of this building that was also some type of shed. So the area was extremely difficult to try and work. Next. Well, here's the area. you got a great big pasture. How are you going to find it? Well, you get a metal detector and you just start making diagonal runs across the pasture until you hit something that's metal. You put in a post like that and you start going around in a circle, making the circles bigger and putting something down where you find it. Uh, some type of post or a rock or something. And you eventually get an idea of where you're at. Next. Hillary Delaney helped me with this. I had worked with the previous owners to try and get a picture of this house to see what it looked like. Well, there it is. That's the front of it. And there's that building on the left that I told you was some type of service area or repair center. Next. This is interesting. Um, this is called a double-shouldered chimney. And over here you have a different chimney. This is probably from the early 1800s. Over here is just another chimney. And this is why the fellow tore it down. There's no roof left. Over here there's nothing at all. So this may have been built in two stages. I can't tell. There's nothing there to tell me. I can say. So at the house site, we start finding more horseshoes. Down below is an iron pot cover. And what would it be if we didn't find another coin? <laughs> this one's bad. But it had a rim around the bit that uh, Steve Cochran could determine what it was. And he and the owner came up with about 1829 to 1857. That's the best they can figure. More horseshoes and chain. Um, miscellaneous metal. An axe, and in the center of that top picture you have a, a log splitter. They're very rare. Uh, if you find 15 axes, you might find one of those. This site had two of them. Down below you've got an old colonial hinge and a spike hinge. Uh, that's the largest and the smallest horseshoe I found on the property. <laughs> Down below the lower picture, the very bottom <coughs> item, that's part of the stirrup. Yeah. Uh, you see up top there, all that was found in a two square foot, two foot square area. Twenty-one pieces of pottery and twenty-three pieces of metal. Wow. If you look at the picture below it, 
you'll see that same uh, shoe repair piece there. This is unusual. I'm not sure what it is. It's a, a buckle that's curved like the old ones they used to use on colonial shoes and that. I'm not sure what it is, but that's what it looks like to me. It's a matter of interpretation. Next, let's find something else strange. Here's a four and a half inch uh, homemade iron spear. At first, I thought it could be from a file or something, but I couldn't find any indication of it. I know that the Indians did trade or did trade pelts for uh, iron kettles and things like that, brass ones, and then they did reuse the metal. I do not know when it was made. It could have been made by Indians. I'm not sure. But that's very strange. And let's add one more, another coin. Next, this ended up to be an 1806 British George III halfpenny. You can barely see anything on either coin. If you look here, you can see a woman. Okay, and here I don't know what that is. So I got a hold of Steve again. I said, Steve, help. <laughs> So you can see the top left picture there, he started uh, overlaying the pictures to see what he could get. And he said that the bottom left part of these coins will help you determine who it was. So he came in though and he, he looked at every section of it and came up with it being a, a half penny. So how's an 1806 coin from Britain get here? Again, uh, miscellaneous uh, pieces of metal up top. You've got a, I think it's a 500 gram uh, weight. Down below, you've got another spike hinge horseshoe and a little bell there on the bottom left. Next. And there's Curtis Stanford, the manager of the farm. He came up to me and says, that looks like fun. I'd like to try that. Would you teach me how to use it? So I gave him a metal detector, showed him how to use it, and he had a horseshoe within five minutes. <laughs> Needless to say, he thought it was very easy until he tried it some more. But you can tell by the smile, he was extremely pleased. Uh, part of this is showing people how to do things you know, that they normally don't do. Down below there, you'll see a uh, doorknob. Uh, then we have a a spout to a pump. It had a patent date on 1889. Uh, I think this is a primitive uh, surveyor's plumb bob. And this, remember all the pounds of uh, tobacco? I think that's a spear point that they used to uh, stab the plants when they were taking them. Huh. Uh, then there's a lock of key. So the results of that uh, site. You have the foreign coin, you got tobacco spears, a lot of coins, possible Indian piece, and a spear point that uh, shows that they really were uh, growing tobacco. Next. Site 13 is just up the road from it. Very small site until I found out what was really going on. Uh, it was just a piece of cement there about four foot by four foot. And it was right near the dirt road that goes up through the property. And that's what we found, uh, a, a couple spikes there, one of them in concrete and miscellaneous uh, material below. But lo and behold, <coughs> unbeknownst to me, I found out through an aerial pic uh, photography picture, there were more buildings there. And we didn't know. So I started finding various types of pieces of metal next. Uh, saw up there, hinge, and more metal next. Uh, down below there, there's a chain with an actual lock still hooked on it. Next. Uh, that top picture, that big spike there is about three foot long. Other metal, piece of hinge below. Next. Then I found a piece of uh, 
metal that was brass and copper it evidently got uh, heated up and melted together. They said that there was a blacksmith shop here, so I assumed somebody was doing something. Next, we get site 14. This is further up the road. It's another area that could not be worked. That uh, square up there at the top, that's a tower. 150 feet from that, there's some X's. The only problem with the area is that they've got big um, pieces of uh, gravel there that's about four to five inches thick. You can't get through it. Mm -hmm. I did get a couple things, but that's it. <coughs> uh, those are called tow bars. Each one of those weighs about five pounds. I thought that was an awful large uh, item to haul normal uh, equipment around a farm, but maybe I'm wrong. Now, <coughs> interesting circular. Dated 1865. Goss Henderson School, which I've heard a lot about. If you look at it, there's some very interesting people there. They, on top, oh, way up top there, they say the average age of the people in that school before they died was 46. <coughs> Six of those people that went to that school became preachers. Uh, down below, you'll see names like caves, graves, bushes, uh, terrells, pies. <coughs> Then, if you look even closer, you see what happened to these people. They went to Arkansas, Idaho, Idaho, Virginia, all over the country. So that leads into the next item. Next. I thought that at first that might be the Doss Henderson School because I was told there was a schoolhouse on the property. But if you look at it, it looks like the old clapboard types. Uh, construction in the early 1900s, and what I read in the book was that the uh, Goss Henderson School was made of brick. So obviously that wasn't it, but it was a schoolhouse. And Hillary Delaney helped me with this. Up top is the information that uh, this came from Garrison Creek. It was built in 1900 to serve the community of Garrison Creek, which was a thriving river landing, but then it closed down. Hmm. Down below you see how it looks today. If you try and go in there and work, you've got thorn trees about every 10 foot. Hmm. It's darn near impossible to work, but then you realize that some of the material you're finding in there are lamps from the 18 or from 1960s. Hmm. And then you find out that there was a trailer park below it for years hmm. and that there was a fire there. <coughs> So you're really not going to find much. You really are. But you can find out, you know, what it was. Next. And then I found out when it got there, 1929. That's the step going into it. Somebody put a date on it. I accidentally saw it there and cleaned it off, and there it was. Next. Uh, that's just the area for a pump. There was no pump or anything there. Next. Uh, this I called the tree cutter house. The reason being that in the 1950s or 60s, supposedly there were uh, people, that, lumbermen, that came in and cut down the trees. And I actually saw a stump of what well, was probably a walnut tree like that. So I know they were there, and I was told that people rented that out. If you look at the front of that house, and you draw a line down the center, there's actually two separate apartments in there. There's a wall in between and two doors. The only problem is it doesn't make sense because there's not one piece of garbage there. There's no ceramics. There's nothing. Absolutely nothing. Uh, I've made maybe six visits there going out further and further thinking maybe they hauled their garbage away a little. There's nothing there. The only thing we did find was that Dixie Flyer uh, stove door which dates uh, early 1900s, I believe. So I have no idea what's going on there. I'll have to keep looking. Next. This is Site 17. Uh, Curtis Stanford threw it up for me on a piece of scrap paper. Over there to the left are the first D1 and D2 and 3 we talked about, the wells and that. 
Well, this road does not come out like this. This is all pasture. You have maybe 20 feet of forest in here, and that's where the, uh, the dirt road was. It took about three visits to even find all this. And to try and find that piece of equipment he said was there, uh, very hard to get to. The piece of equipment was there, and the only other thing that was there was wire. That's, that's it. Thanks. So this is what's there, and it's really gorgeous. It's an old uh, sickle that they used to cut hay or whatever, and there is a uh, vine growing through it. And you can see the blades over to the left. It's really not in bad shape. It just looks like it. Then I took a picture, closer picture next, so that I could confirm what it was. Next. And there's a picture I found of how they used it. 1903. Now I have to confess, I really lost it. I had to try it out. Next. <laughs> <laughs> I tried it out. But I sat on that thing and I said, you've got to be nuts to have a horse pull this. You could end up in front of that sickle. So that, that was a rough find that we found next. Here we go into the last site, the barn, 1880s. It, the barn didn't make complete sense either because the center part there had stones under it like usual for foundation, but the ends had poured cement. And I said, that had to be added. So I got a hold of Mr. Helmer and said, yeah, we add that in the 70s. This you will see is probably your typical uh, farm of today. Uh, there it is from the back. It's starting to deteriorate. You can see the wood peg, pegs there at the bottom. Thanks. And there you can see it part of the foundation. Uh, down here on the lower picture, you see all that gravel there. Here again, it makes it hard to work. Right? There's an old corn crib. What was interesting about it was that they put pipes down there, filled them with cement, and somehow raised that corn crib up and have it sitting on it. But it's not being used for corn. The only thing that, uh, that's being done on that farm is to uh, raise cattle. So this is how you find the farm and the corn crib. About five inches of liquid stool. So that, with the uh, gravel, makes it a little bit tough to try and work. Especially unless you want to buy new uh, machinery all the time. That's, that's a little pump house. And on the other side of it there you see one of the ponds. They actually pumped it from the pond up to the barn when, when they were using it. Down below is another building on the property that's deteriorating. Uh, don't get me wrong, I understand these fellows have to make a living. It's just sad to see the farms go. Uh, that's why I'm encouraging even one of you to go out and start doing some of the work with the uh, barns and that so that we'll have some record of what's going on. And uh, you can use staples to help you put the things together in a book. You can write up whatever you want, and you have a book put in the library so that people will know. I you do this at your own expense. I have a book in the library for every site every year so that someone in the future may want to see it. Remember I told you about, I found some buildings I didn't know were there? There they are. This is the house. This was a garden. Building, building. Building, building, building. Go to the next slide. They're gone. The house is gone. No, the house is still there, just barely. And you can see 275 cut in. Next. So I didn't find a heck of a lot um, on one part of it. A lot of that material I showed you previously came from those buildings. Next. This is the final picture. I'm not going to tell you what it is, and I'm not going to tell you where it's at. Okay? It is probably the rarest structure in all of Boone County. I spent uh, six uh, weeks with uh, two other people just clearing out what was in front of it. It had multiple very unusual uses. 
you're going to have to wait probably till about next January to find out. About it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's worth a wait. <laughs> Betsy, I think we have to hand out some numbers. Thank you now.